Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everybody. It's Wednesday night. That means we're right here with you for Friends and Fiction. We've got an amazing evening ahead of us with two fabulous writers of romantic comedy. So let's get started. Oh, I forgot to say I'm Mary Kay Andrews. <laughs> yes, I'm Kristen. you are. <laughs> yes, you are. I'm Kristen Harbell. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. And I'm Patty Callahan Henry. And this is Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores, authors, and librarians. Tonight, we'll be talking with Catherine Center and Linda Holmes, and Leslie Hooten will join us for the afterwards after show. Yeah, but first, we are so grateful to you for your over-the-top amazing response to our behind-the-book partnership with our friends at Fable, a free app for your phone or tablet with loads of incredible book clubs to join. So the app is free. You can join a whole bunch of book clubs for free. But if you want to be with us in our premium app, that is going to be $5 a month, or you can purchase an annual premium all-access membership for just $70 for the entire year to join all of the premium clubs, including um, my personal favorite, which is LeVar Burton's book club. How cool is that? It's like reading Yay. rainbow. So make sure to visit <laughs> fable.co backslash friends and fiction to sign up today. And right now we are reading Ellen Hildebrand's The Hotel in Nantucket. And I believe Christy has been leading that chat. So it's a lot of fun. If you're into that book, this is a great place to go and discuss it. Oh, yeah. We got to talk about so many great things. So if you love this book or you haven't read it yet, if you're one of the four people in America that has not <laughs> yet read The Hotel Nantucket or you've read it and want to talk about it, come over because we're having yeah. a really good time. OK, and so I think you've probably heard that the four of us are on the road together and we have two events left this season, a chance to see us all together in person, which means we get to hug each other in just a few days. So I having, know. I can't wait to see y'all. We're having a luncheon event on Thursday, July 21st in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. You can find um, info, event info and, and a ticketing link on the Browse About Books website. And then the evening before, all four of us will be in store at Bethany Beach Books in Bethany Beach, Delaware. And you can meet us there Wednesday, July 20th at 6 p.m. Um, you do need to register for that at Bethany Beach Books um, on their website. And we, we really want to see y'all. So come see us. We can't wait to be with y'all in person. And don't forget... As you know, we continue to encourage you to support independent booksellers, just like the two that we're visiting next yep. week. But if you can't show up and you can't visit, one way you can support indie bookstores is by visiting our Friends and Fiction Bookshop.org page, where you can find Catherine's books and Linda's books and Leslie's books. And guess who else's books? <laughs> Four of us, all at a discount. And also this week, we're going to give you a chance to ask us anything. We did give you a chance. So you missed your chance if you didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> but you still can. The next show. Over. Yeah. Right. So if you want to ask the four of us a question, <laughs> drop it in the comments now for next week or future weeks. We want to hear from you. And, you know, we got so many great questions that I had a hard time choosing just one. Mm -hmm. But this seemed timely because so many of us are road tripping this time of year. Yeah. And so um, someone who asked that, asked what's your favorite audiobook ever and why patty mine i'm gonna cheat and give two because but they're totally different so i loved daisy jones in the six on audio oh, i just awesome. felt like it, it was too. that it was the first audiobook i listened to that had a whole bunch of narrators and famous actors and actresses but to go along with our reading challenge for the month which is a classic you've never read one of my favorites is The End of the Affair by Graham Greene yes. and Colin Firth. 
<gasps> oh, oh, nice. Well, that's going to be my uh, road trip listen next week. Yeah. So thanks for that. Firth, reading the end of the affair. Holy moly macaroni. Wow. Oh, man. That sounds amazing. So Daisy Jones, I have to say, is like one of my all-time favorites too. Um, but that is not my answer. My answer is Matilda. Um, oh, it is read by Kate Winslet. Wow. It is so fantastic. And I That's ended cool. up um, getting it because I was trying to find something. Will was like probably six or seven. And I was like, what's something that he would really like, but that I would really like too? And I feel like Roald Dahl always kind of like hits that sweet yeah. spot where adults like to listen to it too. Her performance is so incredible. Just like the change in her voices with the different characters and, um, you know, Matilda's parents, those awful parents and Miss Trunchbull and just, I mean, it's so That's vivid. Awesome. It's so beautiful. So even if you're an adult and you don't have a kid in the car with you, you should totally listen to it. It's fabulous. Now, how does one get Kate Winslet or Colin Firth to read one's audio books? Right. Because I would like, yeah, that'd be amazing. Right. Or you know, both. Like, or, or both. Or, both okay. exactly you know christy i've got to say um matilda is one of my very favorite broadway shows too it's such a great story um and uh and patty you with your audiobook recommendations you talked last week about how much you liked the maid audiobook yeah. um and so i'm listening to that now which is so good is that the narrator so, so like, it's perfect yes she absolutely the personality of that character that kind of mm. succinct in the face i, I don't know i thought I, it was so good i think that's what makes such a great audiobook is mm -hmm. when the narrator really becomes the character. And mm -hmm. I mean, and you can feel it. Um, okay. I don't know that I have a favorite audiobook, but I will tell you that Christina Sivrich, who was our Yona last year on the Forest mm -hmm. of Vanishing Stars musical, for anyone who tuned into that, yeah. she just recorded the audiobook for one of my, um, a, the, a novella that I wrote back in like 2015. Oh, That'll gosh. be out in December. And it is for a novella that I haven't really thought about in five or six years. That's I listened awesome. to a sample of her reading it and it made me think like, oh my God, like, this actually was a decent book. <laughs> well, like for a long <laughs> time I was like, I don't really like this book. I don't know. But like, there's just something about the way she brings it alive that completely changes it. And it just, it just listening to her reminded me of the magic of an audiobook narrator. Yeah, I, love that. I think my favorite, I have a couple, but I think my most recent favorite is the audio of Kate Quinn's The Alice Network. Yeah. The narrator, Saskia Marleville, did so many different accents, French, English, German, men, women, children, so credibly. And the suspense was so thick. It literally made me pull off the road a couple <gasps> of times when the action got wow. so intense. Wow. wow. Did That's you quite a compliment. Did you see what Sean just splashed on the screen? What Somebody he... said that Paul Rudd needs to reach <gasps> out. <next time. laughs> yes. That's so right. I'm going to read Thank you, Meredith. We agree. I'm mm. going to write a book for Paul Rudd to narrate. All right. Enough about, <laughs> enough about us. Let's Forget narrating. Like, he needs to star in the movie, right? Yeah. 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 Um, let's welcome our guests for the evening, Catherine Center and Linda Holmes. Catherine Center is the New York Times bestselling author of several novels, including What You Wish For, Things You Save in a Fire, and How to Walk Away. Book page called Catherine the Reigning Queen of Comfort Reads. Her new novel, The Bodyguard, is set to release on July 19th and is also a book of the month pick for July. Oh my gosh, that's so great. That is great. Book uh, of the month club pick. The movie adaptation of her novel, The Lost Husband, which stars Josh Duhamel. Dumel, love him. Love Dumel. Him. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Josh Dumel hitting, he is mighty handsome. Hit yes, number one. On yes. It hit number one on Netflix. And her yeah. novel, Happiness for Beginners, is also in production as a Netflix original movie starring Ellie Kemper and Luke Grimes. So I'm a Luke Grimes, like, if, if y'all don't know Luke Grimes, he also sings. Mm -hmm. Catherine lives in her hometown, Houston, Texas, with her husband and two kids. And Linda Holmes is a best-selling author of one of my favorite romantic comedy novels, Evie Drake St Starts Over. She's also the host of Pop Culture Happy Hour, which is NPR's roundtable culture and entertainment podcast. She moderates live events and interviews people in front of audiences, including TV and movie folk like Shonda Rhimes and Ron Howard and even author Judy Bloom. 
<laughs> That's awesome. And I've yeah. got to say, you know, as, as authors, we talk about books all the time. And Mary Kay, I know you've talked about both Catherine's and Linda's. Like I, I know yeah. uh, it's, it's something you've brought up and we've talked mm-hmm. about books we love. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm so excited to have them both tonight. Mm-hmm. So before becoming an author, Linda was an attorney, which she says is where she developed her great love for arguing. <laughs> she has a dog named Brian who was rescued in Spain and brought to the United States and who was destined to become best dog friends with Christie's dog, Salt. <gasps> yes. And she shares many pictures of Brian on Instagram at the handle at Primo Dog Content. <laughs> Linda's Amazing. new novel, Flying Solo, was released earlier this summer. Sean, enough about us again. Will you bring <laughs> Catherine on? Hi, lady. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, Catherine and Linda. We're so excited to have you. Linda, we're going to start with you. Would you tell us what Flying Solo is about, please? And then tell us what it's really about. Sure. So Flying Solo is about a woman whose name is Lori, and she um, is about to turn 40, and she has just um, elected against having the wedding that she had planned to have. And Mm -hmm. she is um, uh, called upon to go back to her hometown in, in Maine and clean out the house and possessions of her beloved great aunt, whose name is Dot, who has just died at 93 years old. And while she is cleaning out the house, she finds a duck decoy that she becomes very, very curious about. And she starts trying to figure out why did Dot have it? Why was it sort of hidden, um, even though it's very beautiful? She reconnects with both her childhood best friend um, and her first love, who is, um, he is the town librarian. Um, I know it's such, I keep telling people like, it's such pandering, but I totally mean it. Like (laughs) he's a great librarian. Um, And so she eventually has to kind of sort through what she's going to do with her life. And so I think what it's really about is it's really about getting to that point where you figure out what is my dream for myself and Mm -hmm. what might a happy relationship status for me look like even if it doesn't look necessarily the way that either other people's might look or even the way that I myself thought it might look very good all right Catherine give us the elevator pitch for the bodyguard and what's the deeper meaning behind this book all right the bodyguard is about a woman bodyguard who has to protect a famous actor the sexiest man alive on all right texas brand <laughs> all right by <laughs> pretending to be his girlfriend that's basically that's the elevator mm. and maybe paul, uh, can play, maybe paul rudd can play um your guy jake right paul rudd can do anything he wants and, <laughs> and mary I, Kay, you could be the bodyguard that's what i was gonna say <laughs> maybe yeah, mary Kay no. andrews can no. play the bodyguard Okay, so what's the deeper? <laughs> what's, the, what's it really about? It's um, it's the book that I was writing during the pandemic, and um, it was how I made my own sunshine in some oh. very gray times. And it is the most romantic comedy ish of all the books I've ever written, because I was just like, this is what I need right now. I need to laugh a lot, and I need people to be nice to each other, and I need people to figure out some way to become the best versions of themselves. I want piggyback rides, I want kissing, and that's <laughs> what I went for. So it's as bright a book as I have ever written and it's just total sunshine. I'm, I'm madly Aww. in love with it. They love oh, that. That's Great. awesome. Love that. Okay, ladies, the protagonists of both of your books seem to be strong-minded, independent women who've made a conscious choice not to get involved in romantic entanglements. And yet, you know, shit, stuff happens. Uh So Catherine, how did your seemingly bulletproof bodyguard, Hannah, have a change of heart? Well, she's forced to live, you know, in isolation on a branch with a super sexy, incredibly nice a human man. So that's kind of like, <laughs> um, It's also got, apparently this is a thing. I didn't really realize it was a thing until the reviews started popping up on Goodreads, but it's got a one bed situation. Oh. Only one bed and they have to, like the two of them have to navigate how that's going to work out. And apparently it's like a thing that is like 
people have on their checklist of like stuff that they like. I've never heard of that. Yeah. Me only neither. So they have to figure that out. It's a, you know, it's like life just keeps pushing these two people together. Right. And yeah. that's what it is. She wants to be independent and on her own. And um, life wants her to let somebody be sweet to her. Somebody break up in her heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you find yourself like purpose? Did you find yourself outlining all the ways that they would be forced together? Or did you let them kind of grow into that? I'm kind of trying to imagine here she is closed off, walled off. Here he is. I probably would have caved on day one, right? <laughs> You've got to. Well, yeah, but she's trying to be professional, right? Because it's right, like yeah, right. her job, right? And she mm -hmm. takes like, a lot of pride in being very good at her job. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she really, really tries to not. Plus, it's a, they have to be in a fake relationship. His mom is sick. And so okay. he's come home to Texas to be with his family while his mom's going through treatments. And um, so he doesn't want to stress out his mother. This is how this all happens. So, <laughs> you know, he's read online that like if you um, if you're stressed out when you're going through treatments, it can make things harder. And so he just asks her to pretend to be his girlfriend around his parents. And at the beginning, he's not planning to be around his parents very much, but then wind up around them a lot. And so, she, you know, she has to pretend he, she has to let him, you know, hug her and wrap his arms around you make her. it, baby. Fake it till mm -hmm. you make it. Yeah, yeah. So, and of course she winds up falling madly in love, but you know, she's got some deeper questions in her life about whether or not she is lovable. And so, um, you know, it forces her to kind of wrestle with some of that stuff too. I mean, it's a fun story, but there's also a lot of like, really growth and deeper stuff going on too. Yeah. Yeah. It's all those things. That's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. All right, Linda, there was a bit of a mini controversy and romance <laughs> landia about the choice you made for Laurie and flying solo. She's almost 40 and recently called off her wedding, like you said, and she's resolute in wanting a life of her own. Can you talk about how you arrived at Laurie's version of Happily Ever After? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I said to my sister at one point was, you know, one of the things I'm writing about here is the less common romantic fantasy of somebody who loves you so much that they don't expect you to live with them, um, which is a, a little bit true. And I actually, since this book came out, have spoken to some other women who are in their 40s or, or older than that, where once you've lived by yourself, for a certain period of time, you can want the relationship and you can want the companionship. And yet you can also really feel strongly about your living space. Mm -hmm. Things like your, the, the negotiations of the day to day. And it is certainly perfectly valid and happy to say, I want to, you know, I want to get into this relationship and I want to share this space with, with somebody else. But what would happen if you really didn't want to, if you didn't want to kind of take apart your life in your house? And, you know, Lori is not somebody who shares space just in like mm -hmm. kitchen cabinets and stuff, particularly mm -hmm. comfortably. She really likes being able to have things how she wants them. And she's always been that way. She grew up in kind of a noisy house with um, four brothers. And she always really valued the opportunity to have her own space. So her, the thing that I struggled with as that whole, as you talked about, kind of like mini, I guess, day of controversy was going on was sort of, I, I felt that it was happy and I felt, and I didn't feel like it was trick happy, right? There are people who say like, well, it is a happy ending because they find out they don't belong together and that's happy. That's, that's not that. I did feel it was happy and I felt like it was a happy ending for the relationship, but it is a different, it's different, a different shape a little bit than some other ones. Um, but to me, it's a, it's, it's her finding a way it's this, to me, really lovely idea of finding a way to compromise in a different way in order to have the relationship and the happiness and the connection that you want and also maintain certain things the way you want them. That are important yeah. to you. Yeah. Yeah. I loved, yeah. I, loved, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but I love the, um, 
the airport scene mm -hmm. at the end of the book. That kind yeah. of set it for me. I had a friend a long time ago. Um, he was a sports writer for the paper I was working on. And he covered the Atlanta Braves. He was the Braves beat writer. And he told me that really what he wanted out of life was to have somebody meet him at the airport when he came home. Aww. Yeah, Aww. I think he wanted he, that. That a resolution that is happy in terms of the relationship. Yeah. Looks more than one way. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what my that's what I felt I was trying to do. Right. And, you know, depending on who you are, you know, I think it, it, it sort of, it depends on your own particular life and you know, the patterns of your life, but there are a lot of ways to have relationships and, um, and, and it made me happy to lay that out mm. as in that way. And I have had, quite a number of really lovely notes I'm from sure. women yeah. who have said, you know, this is, I had a really, really nice one from a woman who was explaining that she was widowed and she knew this guy and he was also widowed and they lived in different places and they had kids, but they were kind of trying to figure it out. And neither one of them really feels like moving from where they live. Yeah. So they're yeah. in the middle of this kind of exploratory stage, but they're very happy. They're not like yeah. tortured by what are we going to do? When are we going to live together? They're happy in the relationship that they're in and they're fighting for it because they're trying to yeah. figure out like, what's the, like, what's the outcome for us? So yeah. that's been obviously extremely gratifying and, and lovely. So well, I'm sure. Great. Okay. That's let's awesome. discuss. I feel like you two um, could write, give a master class in romantic comedy. You two seem to have perfected the art of writing fresh, sparkling, witty, no witty novels with great uh, dialogue and patter. You know, it's easy to read, but it's oh so hard to pull off. Yeah. <laughs> and I wish you would, maybe you'll share your secrets with us. Um, Catherine, what's your secret about, <laughs> or do you think like I do that if you talk about funny, it kills funny? No, 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 no. I talk okay. about it all the time. Yeah. That's my favorite topic. Um, uh, what's my secret? So I would say that, um, I, I genuinely believe in love. I mean, all kinds of love, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not just that it exists, but like, I'm a big fan of it. And um, I got very lucky and married like a very sweet, goofy, hilarious human being who makes everything better by cracking jokes all the time. Mm -hmm. And actually, we don't have any overlapping interests, like the diagram <laughs> of like what he wants to do and what I want to do is like nothing. It's like two separate circles, except joke around. And so ah, we do awesome. it together. That's our primary like activity as a couple is just... Uh, riffing on stuff and cracking jokes and making each other laugh all the time. So, um, yeah, I, I think my secret about writing love stories is that I really, I like them, but I also believe in them. Like for, for me in my own life, love has been a very nourishing and healing force genuinely. Um, and so I feel very grateful for it and I like to write about it and I'm kind of interested in how, I mean, it's a powerful thing, all those feelings, but I'm interested in how they can be a force for, good in your life yeah. so that I don't know if that's a writing trick um but it's certainly a like a life trick for me yeah. to, like it's even know. better than a writing trick yeah to I love that yeah, yeah that's, that's great so, yeah how about, how about you Linda um I find your dialogue so um funny and what I find yeah funniest about it is that you don't write long chunks of paragraph it's like line 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 back and forth is that yeah. a skill that you've had to work on or is that just the linda holmes method huh. mm -hmm. i think dialogue in particular is something where at least for me the way you learn how to do it is to read and watch a lot of the kind of dialogue that you like so mm -hmm. You know, not only have I read and loved tons of writers who are great at romantic comedy type of, of writing, 
but I also, you know, in my day job, I, I am a, a TV and film critic. So I've also spent a tremendous, I mean, the amount of dialogue from like when Harry met Sally or yeah. moonlighting or, you know, whatever that I have committed to memory is really <laughs> either impressive or frightening, depending on kind of how you, how you okay, see it. No, we're no, you know, we're going to ask you for your favorite bit. Oh yeah. Oh, my favorite bit. Yeah. Well, my favorite bit from, from, um, my favorite bit from Moonlighting is one where they're talking about a guy with a mole in his nose and they say, we're looking for a man on his mole with a mole in his nose. And I'll do the two sides so you can tell who's talking. We're looking for a man with a mole in his nose. A mole in his nose? A mole in his nose. What kind of clothes? What kind of clothes do you suppose? What kind of clothes do I suppose to be worn by a man with a mole in his nose? Who knows? And it goes on like that. Um, <laughs> And I think you have to listen to a lot of that and absorb it. And it kind of gets in your, it kind of gets in your ear a little bit. And then I just read it a lot. Then I just read it back a lot and say it out loud a lot. Um, and it sort of comes somewhat naturally in, in that sense, but it's also the result of just many, many, many years of influence from, you know, Nora Ephron and people like that yeah. who write that kind of stuff. So um, so brilliantly, because I think that kind of dialogue, you just have to kind of absorb. Yeah. And it's so hard. I mean, it's it, the easier it reads, the harder it was to write. Yeah. I think. Well, it, it, there's no there's no real moment where you can say about an exchange like that, about a back and forth exchange like that. There's no moment where you kind of say, OK, I accomplished everything that I was trying to accomplish. You have to yeah. just see, does it feel the way that you want it to feel when you read it out loud, basically. Yeah. yeah. Love that. Well, and just like in screenwriting or just like in movies, those few lines of dialogue have to accomplish so much more than just what the words are saying. So mm -hmm. I, I do think that's a real skill to, to mm -hmm. have the lines, but then to have what's happening between the lines that carries the story forward. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the trick with me is I think everybody who's ever edited me <laughs> would say, you know, if you let me, I would just write like 30 pages of people yapping because it's just yeah. what I enjoy doing. And so yeah. actually, particularly in the first book in Evie, a lot of that had to be kind of shaved down a little because it got yeah. over, you know, it just was too much of it. So yeah. if you let me, I will just, you know, people yapping about food and TV and <laughs> all that kind of stuff will just go on for pages upon pages. That's funny. That's so Something that I think both of your books have in common is the theme of home. So coming back home, escaping home, finding the home of your heart. It, those themes are so strong in both of these novels, but the, those themes of home are played out in wildly different ways. So Catherine, your protagonist, Hannah, has had a dark, difficult childhood, which I think is reflected in her nomadic life. And by contrast, Linda, your protagonist, Lori, by her own reckoning, has had a close, happy family life, but she's conflicted about returning to her hometown. Um, I would love to have you both, um, if you're up for it, just talk about the theme of home, how it arose, why it felt important, and um, and why it sort of became a piece of each of these novels. How, how about you, Catherine? Would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I was writing this novel during the pandemic. Like I said, I was stuck in my house um, with two teenagers who did not want to be there. And uh, my husband, who's an extrovert, who was very like, he's like a shark, right? He has to get water through his gills. He's just always needing to move. And so he was very stir crazy. And um, and then our dog, who was having a few issues also. So, oh. I, you know, I was home, right? I was like yes. in a forced home situation. And then uh, I wanted to go someplace else. And the place that I wound up setting the book was on a ranch, but a real ranch. It's my grandparents, actual, real. Oh, wow. So um, when I was growing up, um, they ran this ranch and my mom now runs it. It's like a real, it's the real deal. And uh, oh, that's so cool. That is really cool. I yeah. I mean, I think sometimes in, you know, parts of this book are very high fantasy that I've written, you know, the sort of bodyguard stuff and the movie star stuff. And in other books, the ranch stuff might also be high fantasy, but in my situation, it's a real place where I grew up scampering around my whole childhood. And it's like some of the best memories of my entire life happened. Oh. So for me, 
it was an incredible sense of comfort to be able to just mentally travel out there. I mean, the Stapleton's house in this story is my grandparents' house. It's my grandma's oh, house. Oh, I love that. And so, yeah, and now, and yeah, so it's, so for me, that was like, I was trying to, I was really trying to comfort myself when I was yeah. writing the book. I was trying to mm -hmm. write the book that I needed. You know, I was feeling very like freaked out about the world. It seems yeah. possible the human race might be about to be, you know, wiped out. I was like, not yeah. sure what was going to happen. And I was looking for like a sense of hope. And I was looking for like, I really, really wanted to see stories about people who were managing to not be terrible. Like I just <laughs> was looking for that. <laughs> and, um, so I was kind of doubling down on like love and, and, and laughter and kindness and all those like things that we do sometimes, but forget to do other times. Yes. And, so anyway, that's how it wound up at the ranch. And for me, that, that is like a, one of the strongest sense of home that I have because, you know, it's everybody I love in that one place. And yeah, that's kind of how I wound up writing about that. Oh my gosh. I love that the sense mm -hmm. of home came about so naturally from your own sense of home. Mm -hmm during a time when things felt like they were sort of being pulled apart. I, I love that. That's the most natural way, I think, to um, for a theme to find its way into a novel. I, I love that. Mm -hmm. um, how about you, Linda? Can you talk a little bit about the theme of home in your novel and where that came from? Sure. It's interesting hearing that because I, I um, you know, this book takes place in the same fictional town in Maine as my first book. And I did not plan to do that. I do not have any more planned. That was not a, a, an idea that I had. But again, in the pandemic, everything being very difficult, writing I found very difficult um, during that time, I had this feeling of like, I want to put my, I want to sort of hook into something that is familiar to me. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of why it's, it's set there. And in terms of home within the story, you know, I think everybody is I think everybody who reads any amount of romance knows and loves a lot of stories about returning to your hometown, returning to your small town, um, re returning to your hometown, small town. Um, and very often the question is, you know, do you love it? And do you want to come back? And I think for Lori, the question really becomes how to be at peace with it and how to work through how much she loves it without necessarily feeling like she wants to live there forever. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she has a life that she's established for herself. She has friends. She lives in Seattle now. So it's all the way across the country. She has friends. She has work out there. She has a house. She, she wants to be at peace with it. She wants to feel like she can come back and see people. She wants to feel like she knows the place where she grew up and like she has yeah. a a good and healthy relationship with it. But that's a different question from whether you want to go back and live there. And so I think yeah. that's kind of part of what's pulling at her is this idea of, you know, she loved her great aunt. She loves her great aunt's house. Like, how do you decide maybe that's not the right life for you, yeah. but you want to feel like you're not avoiding it. You want to feel yeah. like you're not staying away because you're not kind of at peace with how you grew up. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's one of my favorite kind of, you know, things is when people like come home to their small mm -hmm. town and probably because I loved my small, like, I well, I live in an yeah. even smaller town than when I grew up in, which is unimaginable. <laughs> <laughs> But I love my hometown so much. And, you know, I love those, those stories. But so both of you have these really interesting and amazing other lives. Um, and I'm interested in how those other lives play into your writing. So, Catherine, we were actually talking about off screen, your beautiful art. Um, there are actually people uh, commenting and asking in the comments about the beautiful art behind you. Um, so you definitely have to tell us about that. But you know, even your book jackets have this colorful, joyous look to them. And I was saying, I think I pre-ordered one of your books or something a few years ago and you, you painted inside of it and it was just magical. Um, so which came first, the art or the writing? And does one feed the other? That's like a lot of questions. 
Yeah. You know, yes. They came at the same time. It's like my okay. whole life doing both of those things. And okay. um, in college, I was trying to decide if I should go to art school or writing school. Um, and for a long, long time, as I was struggling to be a writer, I thought I had made the wrong choice. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I just I'm crafty. You know, I'm always mm-hmm. making things and like putting things together and drawing. I'm not good at drawing, actually, but I can do lots of sewing and other things. And um, yeah, I mean, I think all creative things feed you, right? Because because they're nourishing. They're just, yeah. you know, you're, when you're doing things that you love to do, whatever those things are, mm-hmm. um, it just, it's like comforting to your soul and it enriches your experience of life and it teaches you to pay attention to details, you know? And um, I find that I am drawn to making things a lot. So yes, I do paint on books. It's good actually that my books have flowers on them because that's kind of one of the only things I can really paint. Um, <laughs> No, I can't do people. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I paint a lot of flowers on books and um, I just want to make them special. I also love books as objects. You know, I, yeah. I love having them in my house. And I love reading them and I love reading them in the bathtub and dropping them in the bathtub sometimes. But like all of that, the mm-hmm. physicality of, of yeah. books is fun yeah. for me. And so when I have a new book, I always feel grateful to the world and happy that it's there. And I want to supported by making the books really special. Although this time around, I um, have not painted any books. I mean, we're just getting started next week. This one comes out. Um, but the one thing that I've been doing is in The Bodyguard, there's a there's a little storyline about a um, beaded friendship pin that the main character has. And um, she made it as a child and then she gave it to her mom and then she lost it. And then, you know, there's a whole sort of storyline about looking for this for this pin. And when the book was over, I ran out of, um, like, there's always that weird feeling after you finish a book where you're just like, who even am I now? Like, the book is yeah. over. What is my purpose in life? Yeah. Yeah. There's a yeah. weird sort of moment afterwards. And what I started doing in that moment after The Bodyguard was turned in last summer is I started making beaded friendship pins. Uh-huh. And um, so <laughs> it became, like, a little bit of a problem. Like, at first, I just wanted a couple <laughs> And before I knew it, I had like a whole freezer bag full of beads. And I was like pulling the Michaels and like buying more and more beads. And my husband was like, what's happening here with these beads? What's going on? You know, do you need help? And uh, I decided that I was going to take them on book tour and I was going to pass them out to people. Just give everybody a friend. So I've like, it's it's become like a real thing. I've made like thousands of friendship pins. Now. Oh my gosh. Oh, this one. Do you have one nearby? I want to see what it looks like. Are you kidding me? This is terrifying. Look what I have. Oh my gosh! But they're like we used to make those like at camp and stuff. Remember? Yeah, that's so cute. So when you undo the pin, do they fall off? What's that question? You can't undo the pin, right? You can a little bit, like that. Okay. Got our background, and then you can um, you can like oh, there goes there goes a piece. You can clip them to stuff. So that's how that works. But she's got hers hanging on a necklace. Oh, That's awesome. Wow. Um, so it's just been, you know, oh, I like it when things that are fictional sort of come into the real world in that yeah. kind of crazy way that can happen because it I makes that feel very real. So anyway, yes, very crafty. And it just makes life more fun in general, I would say. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. So Linda, you were a lawyer in a past life. I love like telling you about yourself. Linda, you were a lawyer in a past life. Do you know that? Um, And you're currently the host of NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour. So what makes you decide that a topic is pod worthy, first of all? And does listening to all these wildly divergent ideas ever play into decisions you make about your fiction? Good question. Mm. The way we decide whether something is going to be an episode of the podcast is basically we all sit around and we look at a calendar and our very smart producers, um, you know, prepare, you know, look aheads and everything. And then, you know, fortunately, there are four of us hosting now. And so we have different interests and we have different you know, areas of kind of specialty, like, you know, I will always watch a romantic comedy and stuff like that. One of my friends is like a super great um, comic book kind of expert. Um, so it kind of varies. Um, but we really all do kind of come to a, a consensus about, first of all, do we think we're going to have something to say about it? Second of all, do we think our audience is going to want to hear about it? And third of all, is it something that we really feel it's valuable to spotlight, right? Because we're always kind of trying to make sure that people look 
a little bit outside, like maybe the most heavily advertised, like we still cover all the Marvel movies and stuff, but we also like to make room for, to kind of help people discover something that's maybe a little bit smaller um, that they're going to enjoy. So there's kind mm -hmm. of several considerations um, in terms of how it affects fiction. I think the biggest things are like, it is definitely true that since I have been um, spending time as a critic, it does give you a lot of time to focus on what drives you crazy about stories that drive you crazy and mm -hmm. what you find really satisfying um, about the ones that you like. And so I've had a lot of like being a critic calls upon you a little bit to try to untangle those things with other people's work. What is it about this that works or doesn't? What makes mm -hmm. this effective or not effective rather than just I liked it or I didn't like it. The challenge is always to try to really come up with the things that differentiate a successful. And since I, since I work with a lot of things that frankly, a lot of critics don't bother trying to differentiate from mm -hmm. each other. Um, it, 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 it's an, always an interesting exercise to say like, well, yes, you know, there are people who kind of say like superhero movies are this or, romantic comedies are this but when you take that time and really try to untangle okay but why is this working and this isn't working even though these things look very similar on the surface I think when you develop that it gives you a little bit of additional it gives you a little bit of an advantage when you're approaching your own fiction um mm -hmm. to to it gives you a little bit of an advantage in figuring out how to go about it mm. yeah that's great well, we got a, so ton of live, got a ton of live questions. Patty, do you want to ask a question? Okay, let me see. There are, are some great ones. A lot of comments on Catherine's background. <laughs> so Irene Justice would like to know, for both of you, who are some of your favorite authors? So um, Catherine, let's start with you and then and then you, Linda. What who are some of your favorite authors? And I'm gonna kind of add to Irene's question that inspire you for what you do. Besides uh, Nora Ephron. Nor, yeah, Nora Ephron. I mean, um, when Linda yeah. was talking about Nora Ephron earlier, I just actually to celebrate the bodyguard coming out, I did um, a newsletter that was all about when Harry met Sally. Oh, uh -huh. one of my favorite movies of all time. And a woman responded to my post about that. And she was like, my best friend and I made a When Harry Met Sally exam in college. Do you want to take it? <gasps> oh, that's hysterical. Yes, I do. So they I want to take it. Google Doc. And I took it so seriously. I took this test more seriously than anything I ever did in school. I was like, <laughs> this. I don't even know who I am. Right. And um, there were some questions. I mean, they had questions about like, what number on the menu did Harry order in the diner? Oh, um, wow. And I was oh like, my gosh, oh, a number person. Was it a two? Was it a three? I don't know. I panicked. I don't know if anybody knows. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And I'm just watching. Just like, I think I know. I think I know. <laughs> so, yeah. So, obviously, Nora Ephron is like the patron saint of everything good in the history of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, but, you know, during the pandemic, I discovered two writers who I totally fell in love with and um, who were new to me. And one of them was Emily Henry. I'm not alone. I think the whole world discovered Emily. Yes. Um, and I, I actually got to read an early copy of Book Lovers and I got to give like a little blurb for that. So I feel very like, very proprietary about Book Lovers. I'm like, that's my book. But, you know. <laughs> um, and then the other author who I discovered is actually two people. It's Christina Lauren. Yeah. Yes. And, Yes, we love so, them. Two mm -hmm. friends writing, Christina and Lauren writing. And I just got to meet them in real life. They came to Texas and we did a book event together. And But, you know, I love what I love about both of those or all three of those writers is that their comedy is genuinely funny. Um, yeah. You know, it's like, la it, like it's laugh out loud funny. It really yeah. makes you laugh. And, and there's something so inspiring and kind of incomparable about when you're just reading a book and you're actually vocalizing laughter like it's just magic when that happens and so yeah when somebody can do that to me I just fall madly in love that's yes. awesome how about you Linda uh I always try to shout out the first two grown-up writers that I was super into reading um as a teenager because I think that's such an important moment wow. um and that was Stephen King and Jackie Collins yes. um 
both very influential upon me. Um, <clears throat> and then I think as I got more into reading a lot of romantic comedy, um, there are certain writers. I read a ton of Kristen Higgins. I read a ton of Susan Elizabeth Phillips. I read yeah, a ton totally of, um, uh, I read a lot of, um, I read a lot of Jen Weiner. I read a lot of, um, you know, a lot of kind of women who wrote, I thought really fun and, and, and interesting relationships. I also really love, um, I, I, I really, I, I love a lot of the, the kind of the stuff that's out now. Um, I loved um, Alyssa Sussman's book, um, Funny You Should Ask. Uh, book Lovers, certainly, I just finished. Um, I just read uh, How to Fake It in Hollywood. I read a book called Birds of California by um, Katie Katugno, which I really love, uh, which is another kind of um, Hollywood adjacent uh, r romantic story uh so yeah i mean I, I i i try to read a lot um but i think in terms of inspiring my own writing those are probably some of the big ones that's awesome Kristen, you want to ask a qu question do we have time sure sure me yeah maybe just a, a quick answer to this carrie soderman is wondering which of your characters was your favorite to create how about you linda um my favorite is probably Dot, who is um, who has passed away at the beginning of the main action in this book, but who is essentially constructed out of um, her house and her things that she left behind and the yeah. memories of her. Um, and she's a very, very precious um, character to me and, and created in obviously a different way because you don't really see her in real time. You more kind of discover her through her artifacts. Oh, I like that. How about you, Catherine? Um, so the first person who popped to mind is actually a character from an older book of mine called Happiness for Beginners, which is getting a new life because it's being turned into a movie. And awesome. um, and it's the grandma in that story. Her name's Grandma Gigi. And she's an artist. And she's also in like a naughty book club, like an X-rated book club. <laughs> and she's like feisty and fun. And she is being played actually in the movie by Blythe Danner. <gasps> that's awesome. Oh, that's a perfect one. Cool. And I got to, uh, I got to go to the set Aww. to do a cameo in the movie. So I actually will be in the movie at the Aww. wedding character drinking pretend champagne with Black Danner. So that's Aww. amazing. That's awesome. Great. How cool. What a good answer. As good as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Catherine and Linda, um, we are wondering if there are, uh, we're, we've been talking a lot about books tonight. Maybe we should talk about a writing tip. Could you both mm -hmm. give us a writing tip? Linda, how about a quick writing tip? Um, my best writing tip is, uh, start by sitting down and making yourself write without stopping because mm. it is much easier to work off of having something than work off of having nothing. And you will sometimes find that is the, it's that old myth about the ship of Theseus, where if you change one board at a time until you've changed all the boards, is it still the same ship? Do you know what I'm talking about? And yeah. in, with a book, with a piece of writing, sometimes you'll actually realize later that you changed everything in it and yet it still yeah. is the same thing. So the point is to just push something out, get it down, and then you'll start to see what it needs. And then you start to build and then it'll build up a little bit at a time. But like the sitting around being like, I don't exactly have it yet. That's the, that's, that's the part I always have to push myself past because yeah. you just, just dump it out. It's not going to be that good. Dump it out and we'll go from there. Yeah. Catherine, how about you? Um, I have two. Can I have two? Yeah. Sure. Okay. They'll, I'll make them quick. Um, the first one is, and now that I've said I have two, I'm going to forget them. Um, <laughs> the first one is pay attention to what you love, right? Whatever you love in stories, that's what you should be writing, right? And so just, just like follow your own compass, read what you love and write what you love. Like, I think that's like the trick to it all. But then the other thing about being a writer is I think it's so, so vastly important to learn how to practice the art of self-encouragement, mm. right? Because we're all so good at being critical and so good at being hard on ourselves. But I mm. think actually the trick to sticking with it, despite all the rejection and misery, is to learn to see what you're doing right in addition to what you're doing wrong, right? And to yeah. enjoy that and to like cheer yourself on and be like, okay, 
I don't know what's going on with the rest of it, but this line right here is really funny, right? Or this little moment is really beautiful. So yeah, learning how to appreciate what you're getting right is really important. That's great okay. advice. Okay, ladies, if you'll if you don't mind hanging around for a few more minutes, we got more to talk about. But first, a couple of reminders from us. Our Writer's Block podcasts. You know about them. You love them. We always post links about them under announcements each time a new one drops. And that's always on a Friday. And on the last episode, it was so much fun to listen to. Ron and Christy talked to Brooke Lee Foster about her new novel, On Gin Lane. And this week, Ron will talk to children's book author Christina Geist about storytelling through picture books. And I can't wait to listen to that one. So yeah, that's going to be such a good one. All right. So we know many of you have been participating in our very first Friends in Fiction Reading Challenge organized by our friend Anissa Armstrong. This month for July, we're encouraging you to read a classic that you've always meant to read. Mm. And if you're looking for a way to keep track of those books and your other reading, we always love to recommend our beautiful reading journal available at Oxford Exchange. Mm -hmm. The Friends in Fiction Official Book Club is having a blast. The group, which is sep as a separate Facebook page from us and is run by our friends Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner, is now 13,000 strong. So Brenda and Lisa, who we affectionately have nicknamed PB&J, choose the books and host the authors for our monthly discussions. And this coming Monday, July 18th, they're hosting author Emily <laughs> Henry to discuss her blockbuster bestseller, Book Lovers. Which might have been mentioned a few times tonight. Yeah, yes, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. And we want to remind you that we are now having seasons. So we're right now winding down our incredible spring and summer season. And after tonight, we will have two more shows, two more incredible shows, and then a two-week break before our outrageously amazing fall season starting August 17th. But during those two weeks we have off... Keep your eyes out because we have some really cool surprises for you. But we will be, meanwhile, planning huge things for the fall. That's right. Now, before we talk to Catherine and Linda again, don't forget we have the awesome Leslie Hooten on the Afterward show. Okay. Catherine and Linda, we started this way back at the beginning of the show, and it's one of our favorite questions to ask, and it gives so much insight. So I'm going to start with you, Linda. What were the family values around reading and writing when you were growing up? And how do you think that has impacted the writer you are today? Um, I was always encouraged to read and I was always encouraged that everyone didn't want to write books when they were a kid. <laughs> I was so... I was so encouraged in that belief and I always wow. wanted to write stories. I started writing stories when I was so little and we had like the, you know, my dad had the typewriter in his desk on the big, mm -hmm. like swinging arm that would come out and go <laughs> out of his desk. And then you would type and then put it away chunk. And I typed <laughs> on that thing. I typed some of my first stories on there. Um, so I think the value around reading was encouragement. You know, we did a lot of camping as a family and we would read aloud at night. I remember we read Sounder and stuff like that. But we also read, I remember my dad reading us a book of um, like scary short stories. He read us this um, from... Um, I think the Telltale Heart was in there, but also mm -hmm. Leiningen versus the Ants, which is this like wild story about this guy battling ants oh, yeah. and um, Most Dangerous Game, which is about yeah. the guy who discovers he's being hunted. And so like it's even from when I was young, they read us a lot of different stuff. And I think it was just encouragement and joy around <laughs> reading and writing um, probably is what the value was. That's awesome. That. How about you, Miss Catherine? Um, well, my mom is a she's a she's a librarian she has a master's in library science and she um she took us to the library all the time i mean you know and and also the bookstore you know like there were a lot of things we could not talk my parents into but they never said no to books you know books were <laughs> books were great um so i give my mom a lot of credit and my dad is a fantastic reader like he read us uh, all of the alice in wonderland books and he just he likes the music of language he likes the way words sound and he, he's just, I feel like, you know, he could have had a career as an audiobook narrator. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, 
But I think that for me, the big thing that kind of doomed me to want to be a writer was um, sixth grade writing fan fiction about Duran Duran. <laughs> Duran Duran. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I'll I mean, run for you. I'll, I'll run for you. Yeah, we got invented <laughs> fan fiction. I mean, uh, along with like many, many other teenage girls in the 80s. And um, I wrote a very compelling novel about how all five members of Duran Duran fell madly in love with me and excellent you had to choose <laughs> I had to choose and as you can imagine it was pretty wrenching you know who did you pick you picked wait don't choose? tell me don't tell me don't tell me you picked John Taylor you know that would have been a good choice he's aged very well um I was <laughs> LeBon I was gonna say it's the, that's the that's the decision that's right that's I feel like that's the decision right <laughs> You know, I was very dorky in the sixth grade and very hard on myself and very miserable. And I had two best friends who were also very dorky and hard on themselves and miserable. And we were all in love with Duran Duran. And we each, each of us wrote a novel. And so we would get together <laughs> on the weekends. We'd put on our PJs. We'd pile into somebody's bed. We'd open up our little spiral notebooks and we would read our novels to each other. And it's yeah, you would. That's amazing. <laughs> you know? And we very kindly included each other as secondary characters, right? Because there was only one of me in mm. my novel and there were sure for men who were going to have their hearts destroyed when I chose. I could choose your friends. Exactly. So they were there <laughs> to pieces. It was, but that's the thing. Like, that's what, that's where I got hooked because it was so <laughs> fun, you know? Like, real life was so bad. And it was so, I so demand fun. to read all of these novels. Oh, yes! I, was going to I don't know. They were awesome. great. And Linda, that you could rattle off the names of the Duran Duran guy. Oh, um, that's only amazing. rattled off a couple. I mean, I was, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s, man. Ditto. Kidding but me? I can remember nothing. a song they sang, but not not their name. Oh, you got like the brooding, like the longer hair, kind of cool, quiet. That's the that's your John Taylor. You got your Nick Rhodes. You got your Andy Taylor. You got, come on, man. This is, this Linda, is so that is amazing. <laughs> I right. love this. That's awesome. Well, we've, we've had a lot of pop culture tonight and it's been amazing. <laughs> Linda and Catherine, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks for talking about the bodyguard and flying solo and Duran Duran. <laughs> and everybody, make and sure Efron and Paul yeah, Rudd. Yeah. <laughs> everybody, make sure that you um, go to bookshop.org and or to your local indie and get the bodyguard and flying solo. And now Catherine goes on tour starting what, Tuesday? Yes. So yes. Go to oh, Kath. Oh, ladies, tell us where people can find you on your social media. <laughs> <laughs> that did not just happen. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It's I know that very well. <laughs> are, are your hearts going pitter patter right now? I, uh, I told that story on a local um, like morning show in Houston. And now every time they have me on, they play me into Hungry Like the Wolf every time. <laughs> Yes. It's still good. So. <laughs> Catherine, where can people find you? So, um, on social media? I am mostly on Instagram because um, it's just full of books and happiness for me. Um, and then I've got, uh, so it's just Instagram Catherine Center. And then I've got a website that, um, you know, I spend a lot of time updating and playing with. And, having and, and Linda, what about you? Uh, you can find me at Linda Holmes on Twitter or Linda Holmes 97 on Instagram. Can I have like 15 seconds to say one other thing? Yeah. Yes. Um, you guys talked about audiobooks earlier. I do want to mention that my incredibly brilliant audiobook narrator, Julia Whalen, who is one of the great narrators of all time, has a book coming out at the beginning of August that's called Thank You for Listening that is about the world of audiobook narrators. Oh, it is a romance fun. set in the world of audiobook narrators. You must, you must. She's the she's one of the primary narrators of Daisy Jones as well. So wow. you know her if you know that book. I just have to throw that in there because like it came up and I was like, oh, I have to mention Julia's book. So oh, I've seen that book listening we coming got out around the podcast early in sure. August. Yeah. She's a genius. She's been one of the most supportive people in my brief writing career. So I just wanted to shout that book out. Well, thank you awesome. for doing that. Bye, ladies. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bye. ladies. Bye, ladies. You have been awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, now you can find all of our back episodes on our YouTube channel. We are live there every week, just like we are on Facebook. And if you subscribe, you won't miss a thing. 
Make sure you come back next week, same time, same place, as we welcome the amazing Jennifer Weiner and her newest, The Summer House, and Mateo Ascarapur, did I do that right? With Black Buck, a, which was a read with Jenna Today Show pick, will join us for the after show. And make sure to stay this week for this week's Afterward Show with Leslie Hooten. See y'all in a minute. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Well, we're back. (laughs) I missed y'all. (laughs) <laughs> I did that whole, what is that, 30 seconds? Mm-hmm. Just enough to like take another sip? Yep. They were great guests. Oh my they, were they were. Mm-hmm. It feels good to belly laugh like that. I can't it believe does. you popped up yeah. Duran Duran. That was awesome. And I can't yeah. believe one, Sean. You know, I know. There's such a generation gap. <laughs> I can't believe a single person in Duran Duran. And, and. Neither can I. Rickroll, so. The whole Rick Rolled thing really had me. <laughs> had me. Hilarious. Yeah. Well, they're they're funny and their books are funny and that kind of stuff. Um, we think it comes naturally because it feels so easy on the page. Yeah. They've obviously both spent a lot of time figuring out the banter and the back and forth and studying it. I love it. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, you know, it's nice to have we love all kinds of books, but it's really nice to um to have romantic comedy and um, to allow ourselves to experience that joy and, and to laugh out loud. I think. Absolutely. Okay. Let's welcome our friend, Leslie Hooten. All right. right. So Leslie Hooten is the acclaimed author of three novels. Her debut novel before anyone else received a Zibby nomination and her second novel, the secret of rainy days was a book club favorite. Her essays have been published in Moms Don't Have Time to Grieve and in Newsweek. Leslie has often said some people have a stroke of luck. She had one at birth. She brings this unique perspective to her writing with humor and heart. Leslie uses dictation for each of her novels and often jokes. I haven't typed a single word. Mm -hmm. Leslie grew up in a small Alabama town and she earned a B.A. and an M.A. from my alma mater, Auburn University, Mm -hmm and a JD from Samford University. She's got a few degrees. Mm -hmm. She also attended the Swanee Writers Conference for many years and has studied with with Alice McDermott, Jill McCorkle, and Richard Bosch. Her new novel, After Everyone Else, was just released on June 28th, and it's a standalone sequel to her debut. Sean, could you bring Leslie on? Hi, hey, Leslie. ladies. Hey, Hi, Leslie. Leslie. Hi, Thank Leslie. you Welcome. for having me. It's our I pleasure. love the show, and I don't feel like such a nerd since I wrote a book about Barry Manilow. So, <laughs> <laughs> of course, Duran Duran is a lot cooler, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Barry Manilow, Duran Duran. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think that sums me up pretty well. You know, a longing teenager, you know, that's kind of me. So anyway. <laughs> awesome. I love it. I love well, it. War Eagle, Leslie. <laughs> War Eagle, Patty. So after everyone else brings us back to the life of Bailey Edgeworth from before anyone else. But now you show us the lengths we might all go to to protect the ones we love. And Bailey has a lot of new twists and turns. Can you tell us a bit about After Everyone Else, what After Everyone Else is about? And then we're going to ping you with the same question we ask everyone else. Then tell us what it is really about. Um, that's, That's right. It's about marriage motherhood and murder not necessarily in that order but (laughs) um, I did not set out to write a sequel I am you know but Bailey and Griffin did not leave my head they just decamped unpacked their bags and um, a, a, a scene sort of bloomed up for me in the middle of the book the mushy middle patty and I was like 
well, how do you get over something like that? How do you forgive something like that? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the magic word sort of what happens next? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, Bailey, you saved my life when I was really in a low spot. So I guess I owe it to you to, you know, return the favor and see where this goes. Of course, the book opens with her being accused of murder for her ex-husband. And that's not nearly so bad, except she hasn't seen him in 23 years. And her DNA is everywhere in the apartment. And it is all over Elliot. So why would Bailey be there on the on the night of the murder 23 years later? So bum, bum, bum. So anyway, that, <laughs> is how, that is how the book gets started. And then I, I go back in time to, to explore, which is what I really wanted. To, this is what the book is really about. I really wanted to explore new love versus weathered love. You know, you've got this new love that was 23 mm -hmm. years ago and then a weathered love, which is now 23 years later. And how does it all hold up? And, what all happens after, you know, the end. And it also, um, with the past, the past sort of informs the present and the present informs the past. So we kind of get a glimpse as to why Bailey is. Bailey, pretty, we pretty much know from her point of view that she did not commit the murder, but she is not so convinced about the rest of her family. So mm. she is mm. not sure what she is going to do. And she is in a pickle because she is, her DNA is everywhere. And the, the prosecutors have offered her a plea bargain. So she's afraid she's going to have to take one for the team. But anyway, it's about the lengths we go to to protect the ones we love. Mm -hmm. But it's also, at its core, uh, an exploration of marriage and about forgiveness, which is hard but necessary. So, yeah. um, I love it. so true. So, anyway. yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's such a good point. So, you know, Leslie, you know, we love talking about origin stories. Can you tell us a little bit about where the idea for before anyone else and after everyone else came from? So sort of the first seed of the idea. I know you've talked about how before anyone else came to you when your mom was in the hospital. Yes, she was. She was uh, the very good mammy, Kristen. She was my brilliant mother who taught me my love of poetry. I infuse every book of mine with po poems um, as a homage to her. Well, she was dying of dementia and my 25 year marriage was completely falling apart. Uh. So I didn't feel so, uh, you know, happy or joyful. Mm -hmm. And I remember, um, I believe it was, um, I don't know if it was, I get the two mixed up, Emily, uh, Emily um, Henry or, Emma Staub that said that she wrote her book and she didn't expect it to find an audience. Well, I just wrote B Bailey because I needed to feel happy again and yeah. I needed to feel beauty yeah. and uh, feel beautiful. And so Bailey just shows up with her cocktails and her fun <laughs> and her vintage clothing uh, Mary Kay and you and me, <laughs> Bailey would have some fun out and <laughs> So <laughs> uh, um, I, um, I just, I, I, I owe a great deal of debt of gratitude to her. And I think that um, the protectiveness that she, she was not, she is not a natural mother. Um, I, I, I like to throw a stereotype on its axis. And like she doesn't cook. Griffin mm -hmm. cooks, all the men cook, and she doesn't. And she's the one that travels during the week, and Griffin stays at home. And I posed the question, well, and, and everybody was criticizing her about this. And she says, men travel all the time, and they don't get criticized. And and I have a husband that's home. I have a, um, I have a brother that's home. So why can't I travel? So I, 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 I think that there are some probing questions one can, you know, book club kind of questions. So, oh, look, you can see my books in the back anyway. So <laughs> when, I was, when I was editing um, The Secret of Rainy Days, <laughs> uh, I, I just, um, 
I, I, I really got this mother's love. I, I could mm. feel it strongly. And I think I got that, Kristen, from my own mother. I mean, my mother, yeah. I mean, you know I've had an unconventional life. And I think yeah. she went to great lengths to protect me, to push me, to make me determined. Awesome. And so yeah. I think maybe that kind of came from my origins, my, you know, my, my, my being on the sidelines a lot in yeah. wheelchairs from surgeries and stuff. So, and I looked at, I read a lot and I looked at magazines and now I, I follow this crazy lady that's head of the design chic because I love all her <laughs> pictures. And um, so, um, <gasps> I, 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 so I, I, I love that. So it seemed like a natural thing to do. And there had yeah. never been a story about a restaurant designer. So, you know, ah, well, I love why, that. why not me? So anyway, why not you? At, why not at, at, at 60. So there you go. Good for I you. Love that. That's so awesome. Um, Leslie, I think everybody that is watching you right now will completely understand and that you, you really embody this tagline that you have, which is a lover of color in a black and white world, which I just <laughs> love so much. Yeah. Um, and you just wrote a really honest and searing piece in Newsweek about how a birth stroke has affected your life and your writing. Do you want to talk about that tonight? Well, sh I'll talk about anything y'all want to. Um, <laughs> I um I have to say my mother put books in my hand. I mean, she was I call her the dealer because she was a librarian too, just like Catherine's mother was. And and the library was my happy place. Yeah. And I always it was also my safe place. And I called it the great equalizer, Christy, because you know, I couldn't do things like other children could do. But with mm -hmm. my library card, I could. I could mm -hmm. I could hike up mountains and I could do deep sea fishing and I could ride mm -hmm. I could ride bicycles, which I have never been able to do, or or, or wear Jack Rogers sandals. But mm -hmm. um but so I could do all that with a library card. So I loved mm -hmm. it and my mother fostered it all and when when I was born, she was not a necessarily a maternal type either but um she always thought something was wrong with me and then a doctor said you know miss Houghton, your daughter needs to be in an institution because she's got these maladies and they're going to just get worse over time and i still think that's a little debatable because i'm a little bit harem scared sometimes but um <laughs> I don't know. I don't think there's a cure for that. Um, if, if there is, DM me after this. Really like anyway, but um, so my mother had noticed my my eyes and my curiosity about light and things. And she said, you know, I think she is curious. And my mother valued curiosity and intellect and wit above everything else. And so I think she thought if there was curiosity, there was intellect. And so she she took me home. She I, I wanted to learn to swim, and I did as much as I could. And my mother was sort of right there, kind of on the, not, not always on the sidelines. I was going to say on the sidelines, but not always, you know, pushing me and, you know, encouraging me because she said, Leslie, you're going to have to be Avis. You're going to have to try two times harder than mm. most other women because of your size and of your, you know, your physical um, situation and your Southern accent. I was like, <laughs> what? And she said, what's wrong with my accent? I talk like everybody else. But anyway, that's what she said. And my mother, oh, you know, I, I always say most people think their mothers are special, but my mother was a force of nature, a lot like a tsunami, you know. And so mm -hmm. she, uh, I, I don't think I would be here with you ladies tonight had it not been for her. And I just have to say, and this is probably a point of privilege and I'm taking time, but one of the first books she ever put in my hand that I just loved, was hissy fit. And ah! 
I love the I love the title. Who is this woman? And, and, <laughs> and Barry Manlow's book, Mary Kate, is said at Tybee Beach. Thanks to you because <laughs> uh, you know. So I was like, this sounds like an enchanting place. So it's um, <laughs> anyway. It was it said in Tybee Beach and New England because the song was weakened in New England. So I had to sort of set it there. <laughs> and I used my little uh, world book, my red and black world, you know, encyclopedias to do research. And mother said, well, Leslie, you should write about Gulf Shores. You know about Gulf Shores. I'm like, well, what's the fun in that, Mama? I go to <laughs> Gulf Shores. I want to go someplace that I've never been. So That's awesome. That's I, great. I, I went to, Bob, you know, I went to Cape Cod and to Mary Kay Savannah. So I, I feel awesome. like I'm. I'm with the, you know, it's very hard to be with y'all tonight because I have not, I, I want to get to know you, Kristen, because I've heard so much, but I have uh -huh. sort of relationships. Pat, this, um, writing this book because of um, the dual timeline then and now was very hard on my stroke brain. Yeah. And many times I was just ready to give the advance back. So I can't do this. <laughs> I can't do this. And I think Patty, uh, email me one time and said, Leslie, you can do this. And different Aww. people along the way, Aww. Lisa Barr, uh, um, yeah. sort of encouraged me, Kevin, you know, I mean, I just, I have a whole, um, you know, a stable of people that are uh, um, supporting me, including non-literary friends. But um, I, it was very hard and I'm, I'm surprised that the, Reviews have been so good because I'll never do it, the, the dual time like let it work for this book because I'll never do it for another book. No, 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 you know. Um, but I know never say never because watch me do it again. But I don't know. But it was really hard. But I was really proud of the essay, Christy. See, I, I will get back to things if you give me a minute. <laughs> I, my mother was about moving ahead, and I think that generation was, and I always really wanted to know what caused it. And it was, I was 50 years old when I found out, really, that I had a stroke at birth. Wow. And oh. I got one of my men in white coats to go on this little fact-finding expedition with me. And, um, and my mother goes, Leslie, it won't change anything. And I'm like, yeah but it'll change me. And it yeah. did. And uh, I, but I, she didn't stand in my way and she, but you know, in classic style, she was like, Oh, at least you can get, go, go get on with your life. But um, I, I was, I'm glad to know that, that it, that it was something, you know, mm -hmm. it just, it seemed really weird that an incubator would cause all that because I was born early. They didn't plug on the, in the incubator. They didn't turn it on. That they didn't plug it up. I mean, I mean, it was oh, a comedy of wow. errors the day I was born. It's amazing. I guess it's amazing that I have uh, two cents rolling around in my head. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I, she she was probably my first love, and she yeah. is probably my truest love, yeah. just because so she's been so she was so supportive. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, I love. And that. Leslie, I know. Speaking of supportive, I know you're a protege of the Swanee Writers Conference. And I know you love talking about writing and what it has meant in your life. Do you have any, any writing advice? I have to think your writing advice is going to be really valuable for folks <laughs> because you've had to overcome so much. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for build, building all this up, Mary Kay, because I don't know. <laughs> um, I think if you love it, just do it. Like Nike said, we, we kind of, uh, <laughs> Uh, dovetailing with C Catherine, we have enough self criticism. So if we start mm -hmm. listening to that, we're not going to do anything. And I cannot not, I'm using a double negative. So if there are any gra grammar people on the panel, I'm sorry. <laughs> I cannot not write. You know, I, yeah, I, I no. just, it's, it's like, have, I get antsy if I don't do it for a day mm -hmm. or two. And but for me, it's not always about being at the computer. I like to know what my characters are eating and what they're wearing. And so a lot mm -hmm. of that time is just spent in 
conversation with them, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. I read something that validated that. Uh, Ann Patchett wrote an essay, and she said she didn't fear death. She just feared that her characters would die because they sort of live in her head until she gets the the um, manuscript formulated. So that sort of is my approach as well. I mean, I'll write down character names or sentences or phrases that I love, but I am at the computer every day. Mm. And it and Mary Kay, there were years, this is not, I mean, I'm 60 and you would think, well, but I've been writing all my life too. I mean, my mother told me what meter was when I was five years old. I'm like, well, you know, this is not going to make me popular. Card, <laughs> but you know, whatever. She, and I love points for her. And, you know, she enjoyed that. And like, as I said, my parents valued wit and cleverness along with intellect and so um i just have always been a student of always writing always whether you know i write notes all the time too i i, I feel like you know you don't always have to be in the commission of actively writing a a story because your characters are living and they're forming and they're putting yeah. flesh on the bone and and, and yeah. so that's that's not really good advice, but just do it. Right. And that's great advice. Great advice. That's great advice. Yeah. Well, Leslie, we could talk to you forever, but I got to go eat dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Thanks well, so much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you and I appreciate you having me. And I um, love being with you all. Oh, thank you. Done in my life. Oh, thank all you. Well, thank Kristen, you. Kristen, I've got your book. Oh, my cute. Huh. So I'm Oh, excited. well, good. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Leslie, I know you're active on our page and with the official book club. Um, what's coming up next for you? Well, I have just finished the touches for my fourth manuscript. I've turned it in, fingers crossed. I, ne you know, I never know if somebody's going to like it. So we'll just see, you know, I, I just, I just will. It's a, it's, it's a little bit different for me, but I like, I like pushing the, I, I, I don't want to be bored. I don't want my readers yeah. to be bored. Just like, right. I didn't know the murderer at, in this book. Until the oh. until I was in my second rewrite, and I'm like, oh my lord! I hope, so I had to go pull out all the now then to make ah. sure the clues lined up. So I don't like to be bored. I don't want my readers to be bored, and so I like a good day at the office for me is to be surprised by a character yeah, I like or be so. Yeah. so I have a, a book that's very surprising. So oh, I love, I love that. that. We love having you on tonight. We can't wait. And for all of you out there, we can't wait to see you next week. Right here, same time, same place. See you then. Thanks, Leslie. Good night, Thank everybody. You.